Hey, greetings everyone. Gleekon, here again, with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we talked about how Arthas discovered Frostmourne and burned the boat so his men couldn't escape, and it led to a complete slaughter by the Scourge, and Arthas is fully now in darkness. So stay a while and listen to chapter 14 of Arthas Rise of the Lich King, where we get the novelization, I'm assuming, of those events. 14. Northrend was the name of the land, Daggercap Bay, the site where the Lord Ron fleet made harbor. The water, deep and choppy with an unforgiving wind, was a cold blue-gray. Sheer cliffs were dotted with tenacious pine trees soaring upward, providing a natural defense of the small flat area where Arthas and his men would make camp. A waterfall tumbled down, crashing in a billow of spray from a great height. It was, all in all, more pleasant a place than he had expected, at least for the moment. Certainly not the obvious home for a demon lord. Arthas leaped from the boat and slogged onto the shore, his eyes darting about, absorbing everything. The wind, keening like a lost child, stirred his long blonde hair, caressing it with cold fingers. Beside him, one of the captains of the ships he had commandeered without consulting his father, shivered and clapped his hands together, trying to warm them. This is a light for second land, isn't it? You can barely even see the sun. This howling wind cuts to the bone, and you're not even shaking. Vaguely surprised, Arthas realized that the man was right. He felt the cold, felt it knifing into him, but he did not tremble. Lord, are you all right? <clears throat> Captain, are all my forces accounted for? Arthas didn't bother to answer the question. It was a foolish one. Of course he wasn't all right. He had been forced to slaughter the populace of an entire city in order to stop a worse atrocity. Jaina and Uther had both turned their backs on him, and a demon lord was awaiting his arrival. N nearly. There are only a few ships that... Very well. Our first priority is to set up a base camp with proper defenses. There's no telling what's waiting for us out there in the shadows. There, that would shut the man up and give him something to do. Arthas lent his assistance, working as hard as the men he commanded to erect basic shelter. He missed Jaina's handiness with flames as they lit fires against the encroaching darkness and cold. Hell, he missed Jaina. But he would learn not to. She failed him when he most needed her, and he would not hold such people in his heart any longer. It needed to be strong, not soft, determined, not aching. There was no place in it for weakness. If he would defeat Malganus, there was no place in it for warmth. The night passed without incident. Arthas stayed awake in his tent until the small hours of the morning, perusing what incomplete maps he had been able to find. When at last he fell asleep, he dreamed, and it was both joyous and nightmarish. He was again a youth, with everything in the world to look forward to, riding the glorious white horse he so loved. Again they were one, perfectly paired, and nothing would stop them. And even as he dreamed, Arthas felt the horror descend upon him as he urged Invincible to make the fatal jump. The anguish, not in the slightest abated by the fact that this was a mere dream, and he knew it as such, ripped through him yet again. And again he drew his sword and stabbed his devoted friend through his heart. But this time, this time he realized that he was holding a completely different sword than the simple basic weapon he had held at that dreadful moment. This time the sword was huge, two-handed, beautifully fashioned. Runes glowed along its length cool blue mist wafted from it, cold as the snow in which Invincible lay. And when he withdrew the sword, Arthas did not find himself staring at a slain beast. Instead, Invincible wickered and leaped to his feet, completely healed, somehow stronger than before. He seemed to glow now, his coat radiant rather than merely white, and Arthas bolted upright from where he had fallen asleep over the maps, tears in his eyes and a sob of joy on his lips. Surely this was an omen. The morning dawned frigid and gray, and he was up before first light, eager to begin combing the land for signs of the Dreadlord. He was here. Arthas knew it. But that first day they found nothing more than a few pockets of undead. As the days passed, with more and more territory charted, Arthas's spirits started to sink. Intellectually, he realized that Northrend was a vast continent barely explored. Malganus was a Dreadlord, yes, and the clusters of undead they had found thus far would likely be a good indicator of his presence. But not the only one. He could be anywhere or nowhere. This whole revelation that he would be a Northrend could have been nothing more than an elaborate trick to get Arthas out of his way so that the demon could move 
somewhere else entirely, and no, that way lay madness. The Dreadlord was arrogant, certain he would eventually best the human prince. Arthas had to believe he was here. Had to. Of course, that could also mean that Jaina had been right, that Malganus was indeed here and had laid a trap for him. None of these thoughts was pleasant, and the more Arthas chewed on them, the more agitated he became. It was well into the second week of searching before Arthas found anything to offer him hope. They had marched off in a different direction after the initial pair of scouts returned bearing news of large clusters of undead. They found the reported undead lying in pieces on the frozen earth. Before Arthas could even form a thought, he and his men had come under fire. Tight cover! Arthas cried, and they dove for whatever they could find. Tree, rock, even snowbanks. Almost as soon as it had started, the attack ceased, and a shout rang out. Bloody hell! You're not undead! You're all alive! It was a voice that Arthas recognized and had never thought to encounter in this desolate land. Only one person he knew could swear so enthusiastically, and for a moment he forgot why he was here and what he was searching for and felt only delight and fond remembrance of a time long past. Muradin? Arthas cried in shock and pleasure. Muradin Bronzebeard! Is that you? The stout dwarf stepped out from behind the row of weapons, peering cautiously. The scowl on his face was replaced by an enormous grin. Arthas, lad! I never imagined that he would be the one to come to our rescue. He strode forward, his face even more hidden by the bushy beard Arthas remembered from his youth, if such a thing was possible. His eyes more lying, but now twinkling with pleasure. He spread his arms, marched up to Arthas, and embraced the prince about the waist. Arthas laughed. Like it had been so long since he had laughed. And hugged his old friend and trainer back. As they drew apart, the meaning of Merdin's words registered on Arthas. Rescue? Meriden, I didn't even know you were here. I came to... He snapped his mouth closed on the words. He didn't know how Meriden would react yet, and so simply smiled at the dwarf. That, that can all wait, he said instead. Come, my old friend. We've got a base camp set up not too far from here. Looks like you and your men could use a hot meal. If you have ale as well, that'd be a yes from me, Meriden grinned. There was a celebratory air as Arthas, Muradin, his second-in-command, Balgan, and the other dwarves marched into camp that even managed to take a slight edge off the never-ending cold of the place. Arthas knew that dwarves were used to cold climates and were a solid, strong people, but he noted the looks of relief and gratitude that flitted across the bearded faces as they were handed bowls of steaming hot stew. It was difficult, but Arthas bit his tongue against the questions that wanted to come pouring out of him until Muradin and his men were taken care of. He then beckoned Merdin to join him a ways away from the center of the camp, near where his own personal tent was set up. So, he said as his former trainer began shoveling hot food down with the regularity and seemingly unstoppable quality of a well-built gnomish machine. What were you doing up here, anyway? Merdin swallowed his bite of food and reached for some ale to wash it down with. Well, lad, this isn't necessarily something to be sharing with everyone. Arthas nodded his understanding. Only a few of the members of the fleet he'd commandeered knew the whole story of why they were in Northrend. I appreciate your trusting me, Meriden. The dwarf clapped him on the shoulder. You've grown a bright bunny, you have, lad. If you can find your way to this forsaken land, you've a right to know what me and my men are doing here. I'm looking for a legend. His eyes twinkled as he gulped some ale, wiped his mouth, and continued. My people have always been interested in rare items, you can uh, Indeed, Arthas recalled hearing something about Muradin helping to form something called the Explorer's League. It was based in Ironforge, and its members traveled the world to gather knowledge and search for archaeological treasures. So you're on League business here. Aye, indeed. I've been here many times before. What we compelling land, this one. Doesn't give up its sacred season, and that makes it intriguing. He fished in his pack and came out with a leather-bound journal that looked like it had seen better days and shoved it at Arthas with a grunt. The prince took it and began to thumb through the pages. There were hundreds of sketches of creatures, landmarks, and ruins. There's more hair than meets the eye at first glance. Looking at the images, Arthas was forced to agree. Most of the time, it's just research, Murden continued, learning. Arthas closed the book and gave it back to Murden. When you saw us, you were surprised. Not that we were undead, but that we weren't. How long have you been here? And what is it you've learned? Merdin scraped the last bit of stew from his bowl, wiped it clean with a hunk of bread, and ate that as well. He sighed a little. Ah, 
I do miss the pastries your palace beggar used to make. He, fit, he fished for his pipe. On an answer to your question, long enough to know that something is amiss here. There's some force growing. It's bad and it's getting better. I talked to your father. I think this power isn't happy with just sitting here in Northrend. Arthur's fought back a double rush of both worry and excitement, trying to appear composed. You think it might, might pose a danger to my people? Merlin leaned back and lit the pipe. The smell of his preferred tobacco, its familiarity comforting in this alien land, teased Arthas's nostrils. Oi, I do. I think it's part of the creation of these pesky undead. Arthas decided it was time to share what he knew. He spoke quickly but calmly, telling Muradin about the plagued grain, about Kel'Thuzad and the Cult of the Damned, and his own first horrifying encounter with the transformed farmers, about learning that Malganus, a dreadlord in the flesh, was the one behind the plague, and about the demon's taunting invitation to come here to Northrend. He mentioned Stratholm obliquely. The plague had reached him in there, he said. I made sure that Malganus had no more corpses to use for his own sick purposes. That was enough. It was all true, and he was not certain that Muradin would understand the awful necessity of what Arthas had been forced to do. Jane and Uther certainly hadn't, and they'd actually seen what Arthas had been up against. Muradin grunted. Bad business, that. Perhaps a certain artifact I'm looking for can be of use to you in fighting this dreadlord. As far as rare and magical things go, this one's a beaut. Information about it has only recently begun to surface, and ever since we learned about it, well, we've been looking long and hard. Have a few special magical items to try and track it down, but no luck yet. He lifted his eyes from Arthas and looked beyond the prince toward the wilderness that loomed. For a moment, the twinkle in his eyes abated, replaced by a somberness that the more youthful Arthas had never seen there. Arthas waited, burning with curiosity, but not wanting to appear the impatient child Merdin no doubt remembered him as being. Merdin refocused, regarding Arthas intently. We're searching for a rune blade called Frostmarn. Frost mourn. Arthas felt a slight shiver in his soul at the word, an ominous name for a weapon of legend. Rune blades were not unheard of, but they were extremely rare and terribly powerful weapons. He glanced over at his hammer sitting propped up against a tree where he'd placed it after returning from his discovery of Muradin. It was a beautiful weapon and he had cherished it, although recently the light seemed to shine from it sluggishly, sometimes not at all. But a rune blade. A sudden certainty seized him, as if fate were whispering in his ear. Northrend was a vast place, surely it was not coincidence that he encountered Muradin. If he had Frostmourne, surely he could slay Malganus and this plague. Save his people. The dwarf and he had come together for a reason. It was destiny at work. Muradin was speaking and Arthas jerked his attention back to him. Came here to recover Frostmourne, but the closer we come to doing so, the more undead we encounter. You know, I'm too old to think that mere coincidence. Arthur smiled softly, so Muradin too did not believe in coincidence. The certainty inside his gut grew. You think Malganus doesn't want us to find it, Arthur murmured. Why wouldn't I think you'd be too happy to see you charging at him with that kind of weapon in your fist? That's true enough. Sounds like we can help each other then, Arthur said. We'll help you and your league find Frostmoon, and you can help us against Malganus. A sound plan, Murden agreed, the smoke writhing up about him in fragrant blue-black plumes. Arthas, my lad, any more of that ale available? The days passed. Murden and Arthas compared notes. They had a double quest now, Malganus and the Runeblade. Eventually, they decided that the wisest course of action would be to press inward and send the fleet northward to establish a new camp there. They found themselves fighting not only undead, but famished and vicious packs of wolves, strange beings that seemed to be part wolverine and part human, the wolvar, and a race of trolls that seemed as at home here in the frigid north as their cousins did in the steamy jungles of Stranglethorn. Muradin was not as surprised as the human prince to find such beings. Apparently, small clusters of similar so-called ice trolls lurked near the dwarven capital of Ironforge. Arthas learned from Muradin that the undead had bases here, strange ziggurat-like structures pulsing with dark magic that had belonged to an older and presumably extinct race since the former residents didn't seem to object. So not only did the walking corpses themselves need to be destroyed, their refuges needed to be as well. Yet each day seemed to bring Arthas no nearer to his goal. There were plenty of traces of Maganus's evil, but none of the Dreadlord himself. 
Nor was Muradin's quest for the enticing Frostmourne more successful. The clues, arcane and mundane both, were narrowing the search area, but thus far the Runeblade remained only a legend for all the reality it held for them. The day when things changed, Arthas was in a foul temper. He was returning to their makeshift traveling camp, hungry and tired and cold, and after yet another fruitless foray. So lost in his irritation was he that it was several seconds before comprehension dawned. The guards were not at their posts. What the? He turned to look at Muradin, who immediately gripped his axe. There were no bodies, of course. If the undead had attacked while he was away, the corpses would have been raised in the cruelest example of conscription the world had ever known. But there should have been blood, signs of a struggle, but there was none. They advanced cautiously, quietly. The camp was deserted, packed up even, save for a handful of men. They looked up as Arthas entered and saluted him. In answer to his unvoiced question, one captain, Luke Valenforth, said, Apologies, my lord. Your father had our troops recalled at Lord Uther's request. The expedition is cancelled. A muscle twitched near Arthas's eye. My father recalled my troops because Lord Uther told him to? The captain looked nervous and glanced sideways at Muradin, then replied, Aye, sir. We wanted to wait for you, but the emissary was quite insistent. All the men headed northwest to meet up with the fleet. Our scout informed us that the roads, as they are, are being held by the undead, so they're busy clearing a path through the woods. I'm sure you'll be able to catch up with them quickly, sir. Of course, Arthur said and forced a smile. Inwardly, he was seething. Excuse me a moment. Dropped a hand on Murden's shoulder and steered the dwarf off to an area where they could speak quietly. Uh, well, I'm sorry, lad. It's frustrating enough to pick up and... No. Murden blinked. Come again? I'm not going back. Murden, if my warriors abandon me, I'll never defeat Malganus. That plague won't ever stop! Despite himself, his voice rose at the last word, and a few curious glances were thrown his way. Lad, it's your father. The king. You can't countermand an order. That's treason. Arthur snorted. Perhaps it is my father who is turning traitor to his own people, he thought, but did not say. I stripped Uther of his rank. I dissolved the order. He's got no right to do this. Father has been deceived. Well, then you'll have to take it up with him when he gets you back. Make him see reason if it's all as you say it is. But you cannot disobey. Arthur shot the dwarf a harsh glance. If it's all as I say it is. What was the damned dwarf implying that Arthur's was lying to him? You're right about one thing. My men are loyal to what they understand as the chain of command. They'd never refuse to go home if they had direct orders. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully and smiled as the idea took shape. That's it. We'll simply deny them the way to get home. They won't be disobeying. They'll simply be unable to obey. Murden's bushy brows drew together in a frown. What are you saying? For answer, Arthas gave him a wolfish grin and told him his plan. Murden seemed shocked. Isn't that a bit much, lad? Murden's tone told him that he thought it was indeed a bit much. Perhaps a whole hell of a lot more than a bit. Arthas ignored him. Murden hadn't seen what he had seen. Hadn't been forced to do what he had done. He would understand soon enough when they finally faced Malganus. Arthas knew that he would have to defeat the Dreadlord. He had to. He would end the plague, end the threat to his people. Then the destruction of the vessels would be nothing more than an inconvenience. Comparatively minor when measured against the survival of the citizens of Lordaeron. I know it sounds drastic, but it has to be this way. It has to. A few hours later, Arthur stood on the forgotten shore and watched his entire fleet burn. The answer had been simple. The men could not take the ships home, could not abandon him, if there were no ships to take. And so Arthas had burned them all. He had cut through the woods, hiring mercenaries first to help them slaughter the undead and then to douse the wooden vessels liberally with oil and set them aflame. In this land of constant cold and feeble light, the heat coming off the fiery vessels was disconcertingly welcome. Arthas lifted his hand to shield his eyes from the brightness. Beside him, Muradin sighed and shook his head. He and the other dwarves who muttered under their breaths as they watched the conflagration were still not certain this was the right path. Arthas folded his arms, his back cold, his face in front almost scorched with the heat, solemnly watching the flaming skeleton of one of the ships crack apart with a woof. Damn Uther for making me do this, he murmured. He would show the paladin, the former paladin, he would show Uther and Jaina and his father. 
He had not shirked his duty, no matter how awful or brutal it was. He would return triumphant, having done what needed to be done, things that the softer hearted had cringed from doing, and because of him, because of his willingness to shoulder the burden of responsibility, his people would survive. So loud was the sound of flames licking the oil-drenched wood that for a moment it drowned out the despairing cries of the men as they emerged and beheld the sight. Prince Arthur's, our ships! What happened? How are we getting home? The idea had been simmering in the back of his mind for several hours now. Arthur's knew his men would be aghast at discovering that they were stranded here. They had agreed to follow him, true, but Muradin had been right. They would have seen orders from his father as superseding any order he could give them. The Malganus would have won, but they would not understand how very badly they needed to stop the threat here. Now, his eyes fell on the mercenaries he had hired. No one would miss them. They could be bought and sold. If someone had paid them to kill him, they would have done so as readily as helping him. So many had died. Good people. Noble people. Innocents. Their senseless deaths cried out to be avenged, and if Arthas's men were not with him with all their hearts, he would not triumph. Arthas could not bear it. Quickly, my warriors, he cried, lifting his hammer. It did not glow with the light. He was starting to cease expecting it to. He pointed at the mercenaries just now dragging the small boats filled with supplies ashore from the burning ships. These murderous creatures have burned our ships and robbed you of your way home. Slay them all in the name of Lordaeron. And he led the charge. That's more evil than what we read in Chronicles. I wonder if they do that when you do this stuff in the quests. Wrath of the Lich King. So we're not quite as far because in Chronicles we got all the way through Frostmourne finding it. So we might have another chapter to read before we do more Chronicles. We'll have to, I'll have to look into it and see. Um, that was... I mean, he's fully evil now. He's got these little snippets of good, but he's he's gone. All right, this episode is in the pipe 5x5. Five five. We're gone too. See you guys next time on Lore of Warcraft.